Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next topic, which is loops and renormalization. Loops are in fact one of the most fascinating and uh, sort of intrinsically quantum mechanical aspects of quantum field theory. So let's get into it, and we're led to it very naturally. If you recall last time, we calculated the scattering amplitude to first order in lambda, and we found that the whole answer came from a diagram that looked like that. Let's now go to next order in lambda. So in other words, let's calculate the scattering amplitude to order lambda square. Okay, so at this order, there are three diagrams that contribute. Let me draw them for you. They look kind of like this. Here's one of them, where this is one, two, one prime, two prime. Here's the next one, one, one prime, two, two prime. And here's the last one. one, two, one prime, and two prime. Okay, so now how does the momentum flow work? Let me draw a few momentum arrows here. If this is P1 and this is P2, this is then P1 prime and this is P2 prime. Now notice that there's a free momentum running in this loop. For example, if you know that this is K, then by conservation of momentum, you know that this is K plus P1 plus P2, but you don't know what the value of K is so that you have to integrate over that. Okay. Similarly here, if this is P1, this is P1 prime. If this is K, then this is K plus P1 minus P1 prime. And similarly, if over here I have momentum P1 running in this loop, and if this momentum coming out here is P2 prime, then if this is K, then the momentum at this point is K plus P1 minus P2 prime. Okay. So these are the three diagrams that contribute at this order. So um, in this lecture, we will not calculate them in full detail. Uh, you can do that. It's a little bit complicated. Instead, we're going to understand what form the diagrams take. So let's remind ourselves of the Mandelstam variables. In particular, uh, you've seen these already, but if you have 2 to 2 scattering with momenta p1, p2, p1 prime, and p2 prime, so p1 and p2 are going to p1 prime and p2 prime, then these variables, the Mandelstam variables, are defined like this. We get the Mandelstam variable s, which is p1 plus p2 squared. We get the Mandelstam variable t, which is p1 prime minus p1 squared. And here the Mandelstam variable u, which is p2 prime minus p1 squared. Okay. These are all scalar quantities that capture the Lorentz invariant information in the scattering process. Okay, now let's calculate the diagram. I'm going to focus on the first diagram here, this one. Let me write down what this diagram is using the Feynman rules. So again, we have here two vertices. Each vertex comes with a factor minus i lambda, and we have rules that tell us how much each propagator contributes. So if we apply all those rules, what we get is d1 is minus i lambda squared, because there are two vertices. Then there's an integral over the single unfixed momenta, which is d4k. As usual, we integrate with the measure d4k over 2 pi to the fourth. And then we have to work out what all the propagators are. There's a propagator k squared minus m squared, and there's a propagator which is k plus p1 plus p2 squared minus m squared. And finally, if you stare at this diagram, there's an overall symmetry factor. You can see you can flip it like this, and the symmetry factor is therefore 2. Okay. So this is the answer for the diagram. And if it's not completely clear how this happened, I encourage you to pause right now and just take a look and make sure you understand how the two propagators here and here map to the two propagators that are here and here. Okay. Okay. So now let's think about this diagram for a second. This diagram depends on what? 
So we're integrating over all k, and the diagram itself is Lorentz invariant. You can see this because the integrand is a Lorentz invariant function of the only other thing that appears in the problem. So what that means is the diagram must be a Lorentz invariant function of the only other four vector appearing in the problem, which is p1 plus p2. Okay. And the only Lorentz invariant function of p1 plus p2 is its magnitude. So what that means is it must be a function of p1 plus p2 squared which is the Mandelstam variable s. So what that means is I can take this diagram and I can write it as d1 equals 2 minus i lambda squared times v as a function of s, where v is a function that we have to calculate and where I've taken the dependence on the coupling constant out front of the whole thing. Okay. So now our task is to calculate this function v of s. Okay, so um, before we do that, before we calculate v of s, let's visit an awkward point. You know, v of s involves an integral over all momenta k, so I'm integrating over k. Um, does this integral converge? Well, uh, let's take a look at large k, what the integral looks like. So at large k, I can focus on this bit here and this bit here. I can ignore all these other pieces. And so therefore, at large k, the convergence of the integral is controlled by the following object, which I'm going to call i. i is defined to be d4k over 2 pi to the 4, 1 over k to the 4. So this controls the large k behavior of my diagram D. Okay. Now, um, if I denote the upper range of this integral by lambda, where I will explain what I mean by that in a second, exactly what upper range means, we can actually see that this integral doesn't converge, right? because we have an integral d4k and an integral 1 over k to the fourth. In fact, this integral is logarithmically divergent as a function of the upper limit of the k integral. And so we can conclude that actually d1 goes like lambda, a little lambda squared times log lambda, where this lambda here is the upper range of the k integral. Okay. Now, um, wow, okay. Uh, normally we would take lambda to infinity, uh, big lambda, I mean, which means that actually this diagram doesn't converge. Okay. Uh, this seems um, very bad. Okay. And uh, in fact, uh, it, it, it's not bad. So what I'm going to argue to you is that this is not actually bad. Um, in fact, this is, uh, this is fun. In fact, this divergence is secretly at the heart of everything that's very interesting in quantum field theory. But um, to understand what's going on here, for the next few lectures, we're going to come to terms with this divergence and uh, really understand what it means uh, in terms of the physics. All right. Now, here I'm going to pause. You see, a lot of discussions of this are actually clouded by the fact that the expressions are very complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, in fact, make a series of simplifying uh, assumptions to sort of um, distill the essence of what's going on in the physics. And in one of your homeworks, you will relax these assumptions and calculate this diagram in full generality. I'm going to try to make assumptions to make the diagram easier to work with so we can focus on the fun parts. So for example, what I'm going to assume is I'm going to assume that we are scattering these particles very, very hard. 
In particular, I'm going to assume that the Mandelstam variables s, t, and u are much, much, much bigger than m squared, where m is the mass of the particle. What that means is we can basically ignore the existence of m squared in any of these formulas. We can basically set it to 0. And it won't make any difference because we're working in a limit where s, t, and u are much, much bigger than m squared. And that is going to simplify uh, the formulas quite a lot. Okay? And again, let me remind you that in the homework problem, you will relax this and calculate the diagram in full generality. OK, so the next up, I'm going to first carefully calculate the divergent part of this function v. I'm going to focus only on the divergent part. And this comes from this function, which I call i. If you recall, i is this guy here, this integral. So to do all such loop integrals, these integrals over momenta, we follow two steps. Let me tell you what those steps are. So step one is wick rotate. In particular, the integral i was over Lorentzian for momenta k. It turns out it's simpler to rotate the time coordinate k0 to Euclidean space. So I'm going to write k0 is i k0 e. Okay. So I'm rotating the time coordinate to Euclidean. Remember, I told you earlier, whenever you're confused about things in quantum field theory, you should remember that it was secretly defined in Euclidean signature. That is what we are secretly exploiting here to make sure this makes sense. In that case, what happens to the quantity k squared? Well, k squared in Lorentzian signature becomes minus k Euclidean squared in Euclidean signature. And the integration measure, integral d4k, transforms like this, 4k Euclidean, where this i, of course, is coming from this i here. OK? And so what is the integral? Well, our integral capital I is now i integral d4k to the 2 pi over 4 Euclidean 1 over k Euclidean to the 4. Okay. So now this is actually very useful because this integral is now a spherically symmetric integral in R4. In other words, it's spherically symmetric with regards to SO4 rotations. This is like an integral in R4 of something that looks like this, okay? where ke is the distance from the origin to some point. Because the integral depends only on the magnitude of ke, it's spherically symmetric and invariant under SO4. And what this means is I can now use the four-dimensional analog of spherical polar coordinates. And the main point here is that this integral, therefore, can transform in the following way. The integral measure d4ke can be written as the volume of a unit three sphere times the integral from 0 to infinity of the magnitude of ke times ke cubed. Okay. And um, the reasoning going into this is really exactly the same as the reasoning going into the fact that the integral d3x equals to the integral of r squared dr times 4 pi. It's precisely the same reasoning, except here we're doing it in four dimensions and not in three. So now uh, you might wonder, what is the volume of a unit 3 sphere? 
This volume, which you should think of as the surface area, it's really the area of one of these shells in momentum space, this turns out to be 2 pi squared. Okay. And um, if you're interested in this, you can take a look at page 192 of Peskin and Schroeder, uh, where they explain how to derive this. It's kind of a cute thing. Everyone should do it once in their life. I'm just going to tell you the volume of the three sphere is 2 pi squared. And therefore, this integral simply becomes i equals 2, uh, sorry, capital I, is 2 pi squared times i divided by 2 pi to the fourth times 0 to infinity of dke 1 over ke to the fourth, which of course is just i over 8 pi squared, oops, integral from 0 to infinity of dke 1 over ke to the fourth. Okay, so this is my integral so far, where this again is capturing only the divergent piece of this. Okay, I've thrown away lots of other information. Okay, so what's the next step? This was all step one. Step two is to deal with the fact that there's infinity floating around here. Okay, so step two is to regulate. Okay. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, I made a mistake here. Now it's correct. So next we regulate. Okay. So in particular, this integral is divergent, and we have to therefore cut it off. And there are many ways to do this cutting off. Okay. So we have to cut off the divergence. In lectures, we're going to simply use what is called a hard cutoff. And what this means is I simply state that the maximum Euclidean momentum that I'm going to allow Ke is some large number lambda. Okay. So this makes this integral particularly easy to do. It just means that I replace here this infinity with lambda. Okay. So therefore the divergence part of the integral is the following i is now the integral i over 8 pi squared, 0 to lambda, dke, 1 over ke, which is i over 8 pi squared, log lambda. Okay, so this is the divergent part. Okay, and um, where this expression does not capture any of the other information, it does not capture the finite part of the integral. Okay, but now let's remember what we're doing. We are calculating a diagram, d, which has a function in it, which I call v, and where this function is dimensionless, and it depends on the parameters of the problem only through s. Because it's dimensionless, and because the only scales in my problem are s and lambda, so v of s is dimensionless and depends only on s, s and now the cutoff lambda, what that means is that it must depend on these two things in a very specific way it must depend on them in the following manner. V of s must be some dimensionless function f of lambda square over s, where it's lambda square because s has mass dimension 2. But now we already know the dependence on the cutoff, which is capital lambda. What that means is we can immediately conclude that the dependence 
on S of V must be minus 1 over 32 pi squared times log of lambda squared over S. Okay. The dependence on capital lambda completely fixes the dependence on little s. That's the point here. And therefore, we have calculated the large s limit of this function v of s. Okay. And um, there is a constant piece here. On general grounds, this constant must be independent of s. This is the kind of information we're not keeping track of because remember, we're working only in the large s limit. So as a result, I'm going to basically just ignore this constant from now on. Okay. And again, in your homework, you'll calculate this in a more honest manner, and you can verify that the asymptotic dependence is exactly like this. All right, so we have now completely calculated the diagram D1. If we go back now and look at the other two diagrams, then we can see that they're actually really similar, except that what used to be S in D1 is replaced by a different combination, P1 minus P1 prime in D2, and p1 minus p2 prime in d3. And those are, in fact, precisely the definitions of the other three Mandelstam variables. And so to get the other diagrams, all you have to do is replace s with t and u. In the other two diagrams. And so we can conclude that the full set of one loop diagrams in this limit, d1 loop, is exactly i over lambda squared over 32 pi squared times the log of lambda squared over s plus the log of lambda squared over t plus the log of lambda squared over u. All right, and I see my head is in the way. Okay. So this is the answer at the one loop order in the limit. Remember that S, T, and U are much, much larger than M squared. Okay. Okay, we've successfully calculated the one loop diagrams. And now uh, let's remember the physical interpretation. We're interested in calculating a scattering amplitude. Okay. And the scattering amplitude is the sum of the one loop diagrams plus the order i lambda, the order lambda contribution, which we now call tree level, because it does not involve any loops. So adding together everything, we find that the answer for the invariant matrix element i m as a function of s, t, and u is minus i lambda plus i lambda squared over 32 pi squared log of lambda square over s plus log of lambda square over t plus log of lambda square over u. So this is the full scattering amplitude to order lambda squared. Okay, so this concludes the calculation, but now we have to interpret it. And you'll notice that there are lambdas in this Thing, which we now have to come to terms with, and we'll deal with that in the next video.